Well, it is a great joy to be here again this day, the Lord's Day. Uh, always look forward to these times when I can be here. Yes, I come from England, the south of England. Actually, we're Bournemouth, Southampton and uh, Portsmouth or rather to the east of where I live. We're one of the best beaches in England, so they tell us. But it is a joy to be here. John and Dine has actually been to our church in Christ Church, so they should know a little bit more um, where we are. But I uh, bring the greetings of Carmel Evangelical Church there in the sunny south, and you're very much in our prayers uh, day by day and week by week for the work here in Arroyo Della Mayor. Let's turn in the Word of God this afternoon to the first epistle or letter to Timothy, chapter 3. And as we do so, we see in this chapter that Paul the Apostle is writing to Timothy, uh, the overseer, the pastor of the church in Ephesus at that time. His desire was to be able to visit them, but in the meantime, he writes to them. And in the earlier part of the chapter, he has much to say to Timothy and also to the church in Ephesus concerning how they should conduct themselves in the house of God, concerning elders and deacons and those who would serve the Lord in that manner. And having spoken of those things, we take up the reading in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 14. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And it is that last verse, verse 16, that we turn to in particular this afternoon, that we might think of the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness, that phrase is there towards the beginning of the verse. And when we hear this phrase, the mystery of godliness, we quite readily ask ourselves the question, what is a mystery? What is a mystery? And we may think of the answers that some people would give to uh, this question, particularly at this time of the year. Oh, many people in their darkness and in their ignorance, oh, they think that the mystery has got something to do with the occult, something to do with the spirit world, something to do with the dark side of our personalities and so forth. Those things that are placed there by the devil, those things that are sinful and unholy. And nothing can be far further than to the truth. That's not what a mystery is all about. Simply, a mystery is that which is hid from the eyes for a season. Those things that we may not understand at present, but those things that we shall understand and we shall know according to the will of the Lord in the future. There's a verse of a hymn. There are depths of love that I may not know till I rest from across the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. When the scales will be revealed, dropped from the eyes, and those things that we see not at the moment may be seen when the mystery is revealed. Oh, we don't always have to wait until we've crossed the narrow sea before the Lord makes some things known to us. In his goodness, he may keep us waiting for a little while, then it's some time in our lives a mystery is revealed. And so we're going to think of the mystery of godliness this afternoon. 
And as we come to this verse at the beginning of verse 16, this is the word of God. And it's without controversy. Oh, many people, they come, they like to read the word of God. They like to debate it. They like to argue with the Lord, word of God. They like to say what they think, and they think they know better in their sin and in their ignorance. But in the beginning of our text this afternoon, these things are given to us from the word of God, and they're without controversy. This is God's word. This is God's message for us today. As we have seen, it's the message that was given to the church at Ephesus. Paul speaks of this in the previous verse. And how does he describe the church in Ephesus at that time? It is the church of the living God and ground of the truth. Early in the verse, verse 15, it's described as the house of God. And the house of God on this occasion, meaning the church. And we, by the grace of God, we are part of that church here this afternoon in this day and age in which we live. And so we come to think of the mystery of godliness. And what do we mean by the mystery of godliness? This mystery is the revelation of God as it's brought to us in the word of God and through his son, our saviour, Jesus Christ. The God himself, who we do not see with our human eyes, but who has been revealed to us through his son, our saviour, Jesus Christ. And this mystery of godliness in this verse this afternoon is expressed in six ways. It's manifest in the flesh. It's justified in the spirit. It's seen of angels. It's preached unto Gentiles. It's believed on in the world and received up into glory. We come to see this revealed to us in and through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. What is God like? We turn to the record here, those things concerning our Lord and Saviour, if by his grace we know and love him for ourselves. First of all, then, we read concerning these things that God was manifest in the flesh. And when we think of him being manifest in the flesh, that manifestation was in and through the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, into the earth. The revelation of God in Christ then is the mystery revealed to mankind, God's revelation himself. All through the Old Testament, the preparation was there for when that day when the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, should appear upon the earth. Oh, John, in his Gospel, John 1 and verse 14, he sums the coming up of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world like this. John 1 and verse 14. Speaking of this manifestation, oh, we read here that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1 and verse 14, and it goes on, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is how John describes the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world and his birth. Oh, in the other Gospels, particularly Matthew and Mark, they go much more into the narrative of these events. Oh, many people, they only think of these events one day of the year, and then they forget about it all through the year that follows. But this is the word of God. This is God's revelation to us in the birth of his son. This is the truth of God's word, which is there for us every day of the year. And one day extra when we come to a leap year as well. We see then that God was revealed in the coming of his son into the world. 
described as the one who was God himself contracted to a span and incomprehensibly made man. Oh, we see this revelation in Matthew Gospel, Gospel chapter 3 and verse 17 at the baptism of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We read here of John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness and baptising unto repentance. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he came to be baptised of John. Not that he needed to be baptised, is the spotless Lamb of God, the only one who walked upon the face of the earth and had never sinned. But that we might know what he would have for us to do, he set the example, he showed us the way. And what do we read at the end of Matthew 3? In verse 17, when the Lord Jesus Christ came up out of the water, that voice was heard, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God made manifest through his Son. We see this further in Matthew chapter 17 at the Mount of Transfiguration. On that time when the Lord Jesus Christ took those three disciples, Peter, James and John, and they go up into a high mountain apart, and while they were there, the Lord was transfigured. His face did shine. And there appeared unto him on that mountain top Moses and Elijah talking with him. And as they do so, we read in verse 5, Oh, that while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice came out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. On that occasion a cloud veiled the sight of God, veiled his view, but the voice of God was heard. This is my beloved Son. That's as far as it went at the time of his baptism. But now on his transfiguration the command is given, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him, hear ye him. Oh, we need to hear what God has done for us. And so God was made manifest in the flesh. God is declared to us through his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Back to John 1, and this time verse 18. And here we read concerning these things. John 1 and verse 18 word again is given here no man have seen God at any time the only begotten son of which is in the bosom of the father he hath declared him and how do we find the way to God oh it is in and through our Lord and our Saviour Jesus Christ no other name given on earth among men no other way to the Father, for as the Lord Jesus Christ said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we see the way that in which God himself was manifest in his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. But this verse from 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16 goes on to speak of being justified in the Spirit. Being justified in the Spirit. And this in itself shows to us that we have a triune God, a Father, Son and Holy Spirit that were there in the beginning, that are there at this present time and is our complete Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And concerning the Lord's coming into the world, oh, we see from Matthew 1 and verse 18 that the Lord Jesus Christ, he was born as a man, he was born as a baby at Bethlehem, but he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we turn to Matthew 1 and verse 18. It tells us the manner in which the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. 
Why not see his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Oh, we see then that the Lord Jesus Christ was conceived of the Holy Spirit as the Son of God. And so he came into the world, so he grew up, so he lived among men. And in the Gospels we have the record of his life and his earthly ministry and all that he did leading up to the purpose of his coming into the world as the saviour of the world, to die upon the cross, to die for the sin of the world. But we don't just say that glibly. We don't just think of the sin of the world because when the Lord Jesus Christ died there on the cross, he died for our sin. Each one of us as an individual, it was our sin that helped nail him there to the cross but yet oh we can rejoice oh we see that god is still at work and the lord jesus christ who died upon the cross rose again from the dead oh we read this in acts chapter uh, 2 and verse 23 peter preaching on the day of pentecost and speaking of the lord jesus christ he says in this verse Acts 2 and verse 23. In the previous verse, he's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who uh, was Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved unto God, unto you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. And then he goes on in verse 23. He being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. For oh, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and slain by the wicked hands of men. But the glorious truth of verse 24, whom God have raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden to it. Oh, God raised up the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead through the Holy Spirit. And so we see then that by his resurrection, Jesus Christ is justified before God. And then one glorious truth is a consequence of this. By Christ's death, Man is justified from sin. But only the man who puts his faith and his trust in the Lord God, the man, the woman, who knows his sin, who knows that conviction and cries out to the Lord and seeks his forgiveness and salvation. So that we read in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, with these words, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Next we go on in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16 to think of the way in which he was seen of angels. He was seen of angels. And we can think of the way in which Angels were present throughout our Christ's earthly ministry. Oh, as we think of this, as we think of the revelation that we have in Scripture, we see that the, that the angel spoke of his coming to earth. This time to Mary in Luke 1, and verses 31 to 35. Oh, earlier in these verses we read of the way in which the angel Gabriel appeared unto Mary and with that glorious news and yet overwhelming news for Mary that she of all the young ladies in the land at that time had been chosen to be the birth and to be the mother of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Nothing more than this, to bear the Son of God upon the face of the earth not to be given any exalted pers personage above that, 
not to be thought greater than the Lord Jesus Christ himself, but the specific tongues that the Lord God had seen he would show his favour to Mary for. And here in Luke 1 and verses 31 to 35, as Mary listens to the words of the angel, we read in verse 31, And behold, thou shouldst conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And the angel goes on to say, He shall be great, and to be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He goes on to speak of the Lord's reign throughout his earthly life and beyond. And as Mary listens to this, she cannot understand it in a physical way. Why, how could she give birth in this manner? But much more she cannot understand why God should see in her the very one whom he would use in this way. And so the angel says in verse 35, The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and this power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So we see that even speaking of his coming, the record of the angels is there. And when we come to think of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, it was the angels who proclaimed his birth that night when Jesus was born. Luke chapter 2 and verse 9. Oh, we we have here the visit of the angels to the shepherds. We read that there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Oh, oh we see here the angels appearing at the time of Christ's birth. Those shepherds were sore afraid. We might ask ourselves the question, why? But would we be any different if we were caught up in such a situation? And suddenly as well. And the voice of the angel in verse 10, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people, and proclaiming the birth of Christ, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. The angel was there at his birth, and when we get to verses 13 and 15, not just one angel, but a whole multitude of the heavenly hosts um, who were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Oh, the Lord Jesus Christ upon the face of the earth, he was seen of angels, was he not? And later when he takes up his earthly ministry, after the time of his baptism, after he had been tempted in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, after he had wrestled with the devil, and after he had claimed the victory over the temptations of the devil on the authority of the word of God. And that's how we should deal with Satan. The Lord Jesus Christ, after he is victorious, he's still human. He's feeling weak, he's feeling faint, and he's feeling weary. And what do we read in Matthew 4 and verse 11? Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. The angels were there for the Lord Jesus Christ, even at the point of need. And then when we come to that glad resurrection day, oh, we see that the angel declared his resurrection. We think of the account in Matthew 28, and verses 2 to 6. When the woman came to pay the last respects to the Lord Jesus Christ on that first day of the week, 
Oh, they came with heavy hearts. They wondered who would roll the stone away in such practical things as this. And yet we read in Matthew 28 and verse 2, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Oh, we see here that this was no ordinary earthquake. Oh, people would argue things around way with their own reasoning. But on this occasion, it was the angel of the Lord God who had come, who had rolled away the tomb of the sepulchre. And the guard that were set to keep watch over the tomb were gone as well. And so the angel goes on to proclaim the wonderful news of Christ's resurrection. Matthew 28 verse 6. He is not here, for he is risen as he has said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And so we think of those glorious six weeks that followed when the Lord Jesus Christ made his resurrection appearances to his disciples on different groups and different occasions until we come to the time of his ascension. And when we think of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, so the angels were there to witness this event. Oh, we just turn to the account in Acts 1 and verses 10 to 11. The Lord Jesus Christ has bid his farewell to his disciples and he has ascended into heaven. That cloud has received them out of their sight. And then in Acts 1 and verse 11 we read, or at the end of verse 10, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And so we think of the way in which the Lord Jesus Christ, the revelation of God, was seen of angels. God sent his angels for his son when they needed them upon the face of the earth. You know the difference between an angel and mankind is that angels have never lived on the face of the earth. When they've appeared on the earth, they're sent of God for a specific purpose and return again into heaven. At least leads us on to another glorious thought, does it not? That God, who sent angels for his Son, sent his Son for us as the Saviour of the world. Oh, that we might seek him, that we might beg his forgiveness, that we might put our faith and our trust in him. Our text goes on, 1 Timothy 3, and verse 6, but he was preached unto Gentiles, preached unto Gentiles. When we think of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world, oh, we see that Christ came for the Jews. He came for his own people. This is borne out in John 1 and verse 11. He came unto his own. And what a sad second half of this verse we have before us. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. His own received him not. Oh, Christ came for the Jews, but the Jews rejected him. Oh, what a sad state of affairs that was. But how glorious are the words of John 1 and verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Oh, the people for whom the Lord came rejected him. 
but uh, in their rejection oh the Lord Jesus Christ he's received those and given power to those who believe on him and on his name that they are the sons of God and so the gospel and the Lord that was rejected by the Jews and his coming always oh, received by the Gentiles we see how true that was in the days of the early church particularly when Peter went to wrestle and to visit Cornelius the Roman centurion who come to faith in Acts chapter 10 and we see that throughout our Lord's earthly ministry our Lord always had time for outcasts he always had time for Gentiles as borne out on one occasion in John chapter 4 when he stopped by the well at Sychar in Samaria and he talked with that woman of Samaria oh that was a crime in itself in those days and a Jew should talk to a Samaritan and that particular woman in particular she was the worst of all sinners in the eyes of many people that's why she was an outcast that's why she drew her well from water from the well alone but the Lord Jesus Christ had time for her to show to her the things of God and to work in that place we don't know each other perhaps in any depth this afternoon we're a variety of nationalities are we not I don't know if any of us are Jews by birth but one thing is sure that God in his great love and in his mercy oh if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ then he has come for us and this glorious gospel of salvation is made known unto us that gospel is preached unto us unto all mankind and now we come fifthly to think of the way in which the Lord Jesus Christ was believed on in the world. Oh, many rejected him, many opposed him, many would have nothing to do with him. But there were those who believed on him. There were the Lord's disciples who served him throughout his earthly ministry and became the apostles in the early Christian church. There are other followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who uh, followed after him. And they believed on him through those things that were revealed unto him throughout his earth, to them throughout his earthly ministry. And then we see that this is something that grew. It grew with the day of Pentecost when 3,000 souls were added to them and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Oh, don't we long to see that happening in our churches in this day and age. The Lord's faithful when we're two or three met together in his name. And he keeps us to where a few more. But oh, there's so many people out there. We long to see them come in. But we know that the Lord he knows what he's doing in these matters but we see this belief in him through the whole gospel record being preached throughout the ages he's believed on by those whom we have seen from john 1 and verse 12 as being the sons of god oh as we think of this oh it's it's a glorious truth it's a glorious revelation as you may be aware of we've had quite a few weeks in britain we changed our prime minister and then quite unexpectedly we now have a king instead of a queen and many things have been said in the media and reference was made to our well, our late queen's a Christmas broadcast on one occasion and she was speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming to her and she went on to say that billions of people believe on him and she closed it by saying and I am one of them Amen. 
trust the thought may even deep be from her heart. So we see that the Lord has his people who believe on him. Oh, we may be small congregations. We're feeling this a bit back in Britain at this present time. But put us all together, the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then still like a mighty army moves the church of God that believes on him and are treading where the saints have trod. Oh, we may not fully understand it. We may not fully take it in. It's the greatest of mysteries. And then sixthly, and finally from our text this afternoon, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16, he was received up into glory. Received up into glory. We've already thought of this of the way in which the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven on that occasion. And there, for this present time, the Lord Jesus Christ is there in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. He's there at the right hand of the Father He's watching over his people. He's pleading our cause. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Seeing <clears throat> he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's received up into glory. And there he is at the right hand of the Father. Reigning in this intercessory way until that further mystery, that further and future mystery which is yet to be revealed, that mystery that will see the Lord return in person to this earth. Oh, we have this mystery now recorded for us in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 to 52. It is but a summary in some ways of so much else that we think of in the Word of God. But it is sufficient for us this afternoon, these two verses, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. <coughs> and here we read, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be saved. Oh, do we have that assurance? Do we look for that mystery? Do we do so as a child of God, one whose sins are forgiven? Oh, when all things will be revealed, when the trumpet shall sound, we might have passed through the portals of death beforehand. But if the Lord is our Saviour, we shall be there on that great and tremendous day to witness that event. So we have been thinking of these things, this mystery revealed from 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. The mystery of godliness revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and in him alone and nothing else. It's summed up for us in Hebrews chapter 1 and the first three verses of the chapter. Hebrews 1 and verse 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets have in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he have appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down, on the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the mystery of God revealed in and through his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. 
What are we going to do with this mystery? Are we going to go away this afternoon and say, well, that was an interesting time together? Or oh, there's something that we need to do. Each and every one of us as individuals with the words of Acts chapter 16 and verse 31, we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been thinking of the mystery of godliness. We've been thinking of God. We've been thinking of our Savior. And when we think of these things, the love of God towards us well, it's almost beyond our comprehension, and that's in a mystery in itself, is it not? That the great, eternal, almighty God should love us as all people. That the Lord Jesus Christ should die for our sin. Or oh, might it be, as we think of these sins, we will ponder upon them, and incomprehensibly, as it may seem, humanly speaking, May we know this mystery within our hearts. May we be found with the words of Mary in Luke 1 and verses 41, 6 and 47. Rejoicing in the God of our salvation, for our eyes have seen his glory. Amen. 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 Mystery be solved. If you're here this afternoon and you have not received Christ as Savior, this is your chance. The message was clear. Brother Robin, very, thank you very much. And that is the message that we need to proclaim when we leave the church. Remember, the mission is not finished. We have a mission to do. And that is to reveal, to bring people uh, to understand that Jesus Christ is still available. He still saves. If you're not saved, please come to me later on at the end of the service and sir, say, what must I do to receive Christ as my Savior and have eternal security of salvation? Brother John,